Welcome to the Apron Academy. This video is specially designed for the dietitian in training, also known as the RD to be. Today, we're going to be talking about the electrolytes. And now, I normally have done videos where it's specific vitamins or minerals, but I'm kind of going to group some together today. I'm going to be grouping the electrolytes, sodium chloride, and potassium in this video just because they're so interconnected it'll just make more sense to do it this way. So we're going to be talking about electrolytes, also a little bit of water since water is the medium uh, for the uh, solubilization to remain at the proper balance um, and then uh, allowing the water and the electrolytes to be excreted in the urine, sweat, feces, and even evaporation. So before I go into specifically talking about the electrolytes, I need to talk about water and need to talk about osmosis. So this may be something you remember from a high school biology class, but it's the movement of water through a semi-permeable membrane from a high water concentration to a lower concentration. So we need um, a correct concentration in our body in and outside of cells. Um, so very important here. Um, three different solutions. We have hypotonic solution. So where the solution concentration may be low and the cell may be high. Um, and so then if the cell is going into, or the solution is going into the cell, then it uh, will burst. Um, the cell will burst. And then the hypertonic solution, the solution is high, uh, has a high concentration, the cell has a low concentration. So if the cell is trying to go into the solution, the cell is going to burst again. Um, isotonic solution is where it's equal, there's homeostasis. So again, osmosis from a high concentration to a low concentration. And it takes a lot of energy um, if, if we want it to go in the opposite direction. So now the electrolytes. So what I'm going to be talking about today is sodium, chloride, and potassium. These ions are important for maintaining ionic and osmotic balance between extra and intercellular fluids, important for stabilizing proteins, and important for activating a small number of enzymes. So the location of each of these and uh, their concentration helps to drive a lot of the reactions in our body. So we see here sodium and chloride and I will mention here that if I ever just mention sodium it probably means that chloride is with it because most of the time wherever sodium goes chloride is falling. You can see sodium has a very high concentration chloride is um, the second highest. Same here. So this is in our blood in the plasma and this is the fluid all around the cells. So it's high, the highest amount of sodium and chloride is in the blood and all around the cells. And then potassium, this is the highest amount here. It um, has the highest amount inside of cells. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the properties of the plasma membranes. So um, they allow for electrolytes to move where they need to be. Um, some is by passive diffusion, some by active uh, transport. And again, there is a difference between like the amount of sodium inside the blood and like all around the cells versus inside of the cells, very small. And the potassium here, like just very small in each of these. Um, so the difference there is driven by a really important or, and a specific 
sodium potassium ATPase pump. So now I'm going to show you this picture. So this pump is um, helps to, it's located on all cell membranes. It helps to in, uh, counter the gradient. So I mentioned how um, if if we're trying to go from a low concentration to a high concentration, it takes a lot of energy. So this um, ATPase pump helps to um, move it across that um, barrier. 20 to 40% of our total energy that we have like in a day works specifically for energy pumps. And this helps to generate the ionic difference in and outside of cells. So here we have our plasma membrane. We have um, a bunch more, uh, I guess, sodium out here and then um, more potassium out here. You can see those concentrations there. So in order to get more sodium in, into where there's already a lot of sodium, um, we need energy and so three little sodiums work to go in, in through this sodium potassium ATPase pump. Three sodiums are able to come in and then once they're in, two potassiums are able to go in the opposite direction and this also takes more energy since the concentration on this side of things, this side of the plasma membrane is um, uh, higher for potassium. So then two potassiums are able to go in. So now it's more negative inside of the cells since we have three um, th uh, three going in three um, coming back in so or two coming back in and so this negative charge allows for action potentials needed um, for nerve impulses muscle contraction cardiac function um, so if we didn't have this negative charge have issues with that that would result in like things like heart failure you know your muscles aren't able to contract so that negative charge is the driving force for the transport of other solutes into the cell um, so again just to refresh we have three sodiums involved two potassiums and then one ATP and of course I'll plug in here that if you watched the magnesium video we do have magnesium involved because magnesium helps to activate the ATP. All right, so now we are in the kidney. <clears throat> the kidney is our main site for regulating our electrolyte levels. Almost everything gets filtered uh, through the kidneys except for proteins and things that are like attached to proteins. Um, and now I've zoomed in on this orange part, our uh, little thingy. Uh, this is our glogomerus. Um, we've mentioned, I've mentioned this before, um, but just wanted to say that there are large pores in here that help to filter everything through here, but they're not um, big enough, again, for those proteins to come through. So now I want to talk about something called the countercurrent diffusion system. So again, concentration moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. So um, I also want to mention, so this, uh, I have my blood in like the red color and then the light blue color, but all the blood is like surrounding this little nephron. Um, and it, um, yeah, completely covers the nephron. It is uh, very efficient. So we're going to talk about the efficiency of this system as um, blood is going down the ascending tubule and then up the descending. 
just as in this orange, it's going down the descending and up the ascending um, distal con or the convoluted or the loop of Henley. <laughs> uh, so descending loop of Henley, ascending loop of Henley. Um, now this concentration difference drives the diffusion. So what does that mean? So as um, solutes are getting filtered through the kidney, um, this solute concentration is about 300. That's the same as the blood that they've been surrounded by. And as it goes down, it's continuing to release water. Um, this happens by passive transport into the blood. And the concentration um, increases, so about up to 1,200. And then um, over here in the ascending tubule, we have things like sodium, chloride, even potassium are being uh, released. But why does this happen and why is it efficient? So as the blood is coming down, it has that same concentration of 300 and it's coming down. So this um, is a higher concentration over here, like with, it's let go of some water, it's a higher concentration. So it's able to release into the blood because we know osmosis, it goes from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So it's just easily passing through into the blood. And so now, because the blood has all these um, things, I guess, in it, it, um, it has an increased concentration, about to that 1,200 again. So then, as the water is being um, released back into the blood concentration of the blood is going back down. So it's a very efficient uh, system. Um, let me see if there's anything else. So the solutes have a higher concentration while the blood is lower. That's what I just said. So that these um, are able to move straight into the blood. And then, um, yeah, then as the higher concentration water uh, is able to um, go into the blood and then the concentration goes back to Logan. So yeah, super um, amazing system that works uh, with our electrolytes and with this vasorecta, the blood all around surrounding our nephrons. So now I kind of want to talk about um, sodium. It is our most abundant electrolyte in the blood. It's a major determinant of osmolarity, or yeah, osmolarity and extracellular fluid volume. So water almost always follows sodium. So there are two main variables in um, our body fluid balance um, in sodium and water. One is it determines um, osmo osmolality, and a second, it uh, helps with the volume of our blood. So uh, the absorption is the absorption of sodium is dependent on sodium, potassium, ATPase pumps. So that's these darker uh, little circles here. Um, so in order to be um, absorbed and then get into the body, it's dependent on these uh, sodium potassium ATPase pumps. Now the sodium potassium ATPase pumps allow for the absorption of sodium and again like if you see if you hear me talking about sodium chloride is often following so um, when sodium chloride uh, is moved along, it allows for the increased absorption of water. So, um, again, this is a lower concentration here, a higher concentration outside of the cells, which allows for negative charge. Um, and then this is true for both the intestines, so these are uh, like intestinal cells, but also for the kidneys as um, 
it moves around because we need those sodium potassium ATPase pumps. So um, intestinal absorption is not as well understood. Um, we know that it's like a passive diffusion, but just putting that out there. And now if we do not have, or we don't have um, sodium receptors, we actually have pressure receptors in our uh, vascular system. These pressure sensors are called barrow receptors, um, and they, um, the the pressure that they sense is due to an increased volume. So, with an increased fluid volume, we would have um, increased sodium chloride. Okay, dokie. So there are. Um, couple things going on with this picture. Um, this is just showing the passive diffusion that goes on in this uh, proximal tubule. This is going back to this same picture, just a little more uh, professional looking, I guess. But here we know, like, this is where the water is coming out um, with that um, countercurrent diffusion system so then the concentration is increasing of the solutes and then here uh, there's a higher concentration and so since the blood is a lower concentration that's right beside it it's able to go on through and then in our collecting duct um, we have you know sodium and chloride are still able to be reabsorbed but potassium is actually um, goes back into the uh, collecting duct so that it can be excreted. So this is the only place that we can get rid of potassium um, and we do this because we don't want a whole lot just out there because you remember potassium needs to be inside of the cells. That's where we need our potassium. So it's all regulated at this point and it's regulated because of this um, hormone aldosterone. All right. Um, and so there are three mechanisms that help regulate sodium balance. The first is, um, bare receptors and, uh, a renal sympathetic and arginine vasopressin pathway or AVP or just vasopressin. Now, the second one is RAS, um, stands for renin angiotensin aldosterone system. This helps to regulate sodium and volume. And then the third one is this natriuretic peptides. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these. So this is the first one, this is our uh, vasopressin. So our baroreceptors are activated by stretch or tension. Well, I guess this is kind of, hold on, on the vasopressin. Uh, talking about the uh, baroreceptors, some are activated by stress, tension, some activated by low pressure, so that can be like our blood volume or when our fluid is low. And then some can be, um, can measure a high pressure so that could be like stretch. So when um, our pressure is low, vasopressin um, signals to the kidney to, and these are our um, tubular kidney cells, but, and this AVP is um, vasopressin. So it signals to the kidney to conserve water. Uh, vasopressin helps to increase the permeability and reabsorb water. Um, so hypovolemia, if we have hypovolemia, uh, it, it inhibits vasopressin secretion from the pituitary gland, 
And then if there's decreased vasopressin, there's a loss of sodium chloride and water. So some effects of vasopressin on the kidney. Um, it helps to treat high blood pressure. Um, we'll see here, and I'll explain this in just a second, but we do have aquaporins, which are water channels responsive to vasopressin. So water um, reabsorbs to enter into or the aquaporins, or I guess how, how I'm explaining this doesn't make sense, but when uh, our water pour, or aquaporins are activated, how we reabsorb the water and how the water re-enters our body is one, molecule, one water molecule at a time. Okay, so let me explain this picture a little bit. So when water volume is low, our aquaporin gets activated. So that is what um, sends signal to vasopressin. Vasopressin goes into our kidney cells. It binds to receptors, and then it sends a signal to the aquaporins and it helps to activate the aquaporins movement. So the aquaporins, once they're activated and they start moving, they move to the cell membrane and then water is able to come in. So as I explained that picture, that kind of explained overall what I was kind of saying all over the place with um, vasopressin and our aquaporins. So now this second um, way that sodium balance is regulated, we have our RAS, um, our renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Um, this is important uh, for hypovolemia, so when we have uh, low volume and then it helps retain sodium and water. This is stimulated by our juxtaglomerial apparatus, so these blue um, cells, and they um, are source, source of renin. It's renin is released into the blood from these, from the juxtaglomerial apparatus, and then um, so I, now I want to kind of explain this. So renin um, cleaves off a part of angiotensin, it, which is found in the liver. Angiotensin is found in the liver. Renin cleaves off a part of angiotensin. It's converted to angiotensin 1. Um, so then we have our angiotensin converting enzymes from the lungs, or also known as ACE. Um, so these are things like, you may remember, like ACE inhibitors can help uh, lower our high blood pressure. Um, and so ACE is released from the lungs, acts on this angiotensin 1, so the angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2. So this signals to the hypothalamus in our brain, um, also our pituitary gland, and um, let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it sends a signal to the hypothalamus, and then the pituitary gland helps to uh, release the um, vasopressin because our uh, pressure is low. And then it also, angiotensin 2 also signals to the adrenal glands or our adrenal cortex, and this um, helps. 
the release of aldosterone, which allows for our retention or reabsorption of um, retention of sodium and then our uh, release of potassium and then out to be excreted out of the kidney. Um, and I want to say that the bare receptors send the signal to um, the pituitary gland in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases that vasopressin. Vasopressin will help retain water, and it does this by the increased amount of aquaporins. So it all is all connected. So this here is connected to this here. And now, um, oh, before I move on. So the third is our natriuretic peptides. They're vasodilating, um, so it helps with hypervolemia. And it's produced in uh, different places. So the three types, the A type is made in the heart. We call it A and P. The B type is called, um, it, or is made in the heart and brain, B and P. And then the third type is C-type. So that's made in our brain, blood vessel epithelium, heart, kidney, and that's called CNP. So ventricular distension by hypervolemia causes a release um, of ANP and BNP by inhibiting the secretion of aldosterone, increasing the glomerular filtration rate and inhibiting reabsorption of sodium and chloride. This inhibits the secretion of vasopressin um, and that increases renal secretion of sodium chloride and um, water during hypervolemia. So when we have hypervolemia, we're trying to get rid of everything. So these natriuretic peptides, that third way to balance the sodium, um, levels in our body. This helps to get rid of all the things when we have hypervolemia. All right, so I've kind of talked about the regula regulation of sodium, and now I want to talk about the regulation of potassium. So with um, this helps with cellular distribution and renal excretion. So that's our main regulation. It's important to promote rapid entry of potassium into the cells so that we don't have hyperkalemia. Um, so when potassium is outside of the cells, it changes the concentration, there's no polarization, no activation, it can lead to a bunch of not, not good things. Um, so the regulation of potassium is controlled by insulin. So, um, we also have two pathways with which it does this. So, here I have my um, cell, and I'm going to kind of explain this. So, um, this cell has an insulin receptor on it. That's this little square here. Um, so, with the insulin receptor, the insulin is able to bind. And when it binds onto that insulin receptor, there is... A conformational change in the um, insulin receptor which um, activates kinases and then sends a signal. So here it's kind of the fork in the road. We have one and two different pathways. So the first one, um, it's when um, it moves GLUT2 to the cell membrane to increase absorption of glucose. So um, our GLUT2 is already made in our cell, um, but the signaling um, allows for the GLUT2 to, or GLUT4 to move to the cell membrane, which allows for glucose to come in to the cell and then able to be used. So then the second function, again, our sodium potassium pumps are already here, but the signaling um, moves these sodium potassium ATPase pumps to the membrane. So it's able to latch onto the membrane where um, it's 
this um, pump is highly regulated, and then we have our three sodiums leaving, our two potassiums coming in. So then also want to say that when uh, potassium is excreted, um, it's excreted when potassium is in excess. So um, it's secreted in those distal collecting tubules and regulated by aldosterone. So that connects all the way to up here. So when we have too much, it's secreted and then to be released in the urine and regulated by aldosterone. Okay, and so that's how we do regulate, but what happens if we have the imbalances? What happens if we have too much uh, sodium chloride? Um, we're gonna have lots of water. If we have too much sodium, we'll have hypernatremia, which um, can lead to hypervolemia, hypertension, water retention, which can lead to edemia uh, or edema. Um, so different conditions that we see with this are congestive heart failure, kidney failure, and um, this is just when we tend to have a higher end of either salt intake or different uh, imbalances just going on. If we have a deficiency in sodium, we'll have hypovolemia, hyponatremia, due to that decreased absorption and enhanced secretion. We'll also see the conditions like kidney disease, have to have diuretics, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, and dehydration. So um, if we have potassium imbalances, while sodium imbalances are very important and they can be very dangerous, um, potassium um, imbalances are like way more dangerous. So if uh, we have hyperkalemia, that's anything greater than 5.5 millimoles per, per liter. So we don't, um, this, this normally doesn't happen if we have good functioning kidneys, but this can lead to uh, metabolic acidosis, tissue damage, cardiac dysrhythmia, and cardiac, uh, yeah, cardiac arrest. Um, so because it's highly regulated, we really don't suggest any potassium supplements because that can cause uh, our potassium to be very high. And then hypokalemia is anything less than 3.5. So very, very small window for potassium to be in, 3.5 to 5.5. Um, hypokalemia can result from an insufficient consumption or um, prolonged fasting. We can see this in acute alkalosis, hyperinsulinemia, muscle weakness, cardiac arrhythmias, insulin resistant, or resistance, and glucose intolerance. So as the RD, um, some different points, we just need to look at our uh, salt intake. Uh, there have been studies, I guess, that have shown that or have tried to prove that increased salt intake could lead to hypertension, cardiovascular disease, or renal disease. But actually, these um, studies don't really explain that. Um, it truly is a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables that can... Um, reduce the risk of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and renal diseases. So, um, you know, I guess with a high salt intake, you know, maybe like more processed foods, more fatty foods going out to eat. So, um, therefore, you're not getting that diet high in fruits and vegetables, which can help reduce that. So that can be one factor that's truly playing into that. And also low potassium. So low potassium levels can lead to hypertension and cardiovascular diseases and renal diseases. So it actually may not be because of our increased sodium, but because of decreased potassium and a decreased uh, intake of fruits and vegetables. Um, 
Then we also have different studies that um, newborns um, that had a low sodium count or sodium concentration in their formula, they tended they did tend to have a lower blood pressure in adolescence. Um, but again, it, it just uh, there have been studies over and over that show that a higher um, potassium intake can help prevent heart failure. There's a reduction in stroke, help prevent renal failure. Um, but again, no, no taking potassium supplements because that can be too high. Um, and again, with a uh, high salt consumption could... Uh, cause gastric mucosal damage and stomach cancer. So it is just taking everything into consideration, making sure that we are um, watching what we eat, really intaking more fruits and vegetables, which I think would help relieve a lot of this. But ta-da, these are all of our electrolytes covered sodium, chloride, and potassium, all so important for our bodies. If you found this video helpful, please like and subscribe and share this video with others. I'll see you next time.